Hello everyone, I hope you're all having a wonderful village. Welcome to my talk, Designing a C2 Framework. Uh, so my name is Daniel Duggan, um, otherwise known as uh, Rastamos. Uh, I'm the director of Zero Point Security. Um, you may have seen our Red Team Ops course. I blog over at uh, rastamouse.me as well as on Offensive Defense. I'm on Twitter, GitHub, Discord, Slack, all the things. If you want to uh, get in touch with me after the talk, by all means, do so. So what inspired this talk? Well, it feels like to me, prior to around 2018, there weren't really that many um, C2s or C2 frameworks available. Um, the main commercial offering was probably Cobalt Strike, maybe a few others. And there weren't that many open source frameworks either. We had um, PowerShell Empire for a long time. We had uh, Posh T2 for a long time. And then Covenant came along and some others came along. And suddenly we just had this huge boom in these um, C2 uh, tools um, coming out. We've also had um, a lot more commercial ones um, as well. So it seems to be uh, an area of interest for sure. And it's not um, infrequent that I get approached and um, people are asking me uh, if I've got any tips on how to um, build C2, um, specifically in C Sharp. Um, so I thought that this kind of talk would be uh, helpful for those who we're looking to, uh, you know, take on the process of trying to put um, such a tool together. Now, if you go over to uh, the C2 the C2 matrix, um, it's uh, a, a curated list of uh, commercial and open source um, frameworks. It now lists over seventy which is pretty astounding, really. Um, more than 10 languages, everything from Python, Go, Rust, c -sharp, Ruby, even PowerShell. There's no uh, shortage of variety. And they all have different um, capabilities. So some, by default, will beacon over HTTP, some will go over DNS, some will go over um, completely uh, custom channels and some might ride on legitimate services like uh, you know the Dropboxes, Office 365, different Google services and things like that. Um, if you're interested in learning more about some of the frameworks or some of the C2 tools that are already out there, I uh, highly suggest you check out The Matrix. It has um, a really useful like um, search tool, I guess, where you, you plug in your, your requirements and it will recommend um, some tools for you um, based on those requirements. So let's take a step back and talk about C2. What is C2? Um, well, C2 is short for uh, command and control. You can imagine a scenario where you have um, us cowboy operators and we have a target and the operator will uh, deliver um, some sort of implant or payload, um, sometimes also called a, a rat, to that target. And the operator needs to maintain some control over that, over that implant somehow. The implant needs to talk to the operator. The operator needs to be able to give it commands and the implant needs to give the results back to the operator. And the, the model that is um, used most, I guess, is to have some sort of um, intermediary uh, control server, um, often called a team server. So the implant will communicate to the 
um, team server over some sort of protocol. Again, that might be HTTP or DNS or some other legit service. And the operator will have, you know, some sort of admin interface to that uh, control server. So the implant will talk to the control server and it will kind of appear um, to the operator and the operator will be able to give it tasks. The implant will grab those tasks from the server, execute them and send, send the results back. Um, it's worth noting that some of these servers have the um, admin interface kind of built into them while others require the operators to have um, a standalone client that will connect to that um, to that server for them. So um, conceptually not too complicated. However, the point of this talk is about designing a C2 framework, not just designing C2. And we need to understand specifically for the purposes of this talk that C2 is not the same as, as a framework. Uh, so if you go onto the matrix again, for example, you'll see a lot of uh, C2 tools that don't really readily provide that much flexibility to the operator. Um, you know, maybe a lot of those tools uh, were designed in mind with, I want to demonstrate being able to use C2 over Office 365, for example. And that's pretty much all it's capable of. And to me, that's not really a framework. And this is all about frameworks. So what does a framework provide? Well, they're, they're quite clearly listed here. Um, so let's go through them. The first is inversion of control. Now the overall flow of the program or the, uh, the programs that are involved in this whole process are not strictly uh, controlled by the user. So the flow is that the implant is going to talk to a server and the operator is going to task that implant. And, you know, the, you've got that back and forth. Now that is a flow that's not controlled by the user. You also have on the server side and on the implant side, a lot of internal flows. So the implant will receive a job, it'll process it in some way and then send the results back. That internal flow is not controlled by the operator. Um, and a lot of um, flows internal to the team server are not necessarily going to be controlled by the user. A framework also provides default behaviors, um, but most importantly, those are behaviors that can be overridden by the operator. So again, we're talking about the protocol that the uh, implant is talking over or the protocol that the team server is listening on. A framework may provide a default protocol for that, such as HTTP, but the operator should be allowed to um, override that in some way, either change the behaviors within that protocol or add their own complete custom protocols. A framework also provides um, extensibility and that is to introduce new uh, behaviors and capabilities that are not currently within the tool set. So if you think about an implant, you might write your implant with a couple of commands, but it needs to be able to be customizable for the operator. They need to be able to add their own commands if they want, their own capabilities, their own post-exploitation capabilities. And they also need to be able to do that on the server side as well. So if you have um, something like you want reverse port forwarding on your implant, you need to be able to introduce that capability to the implant. The implant needs to send that data to the uh, to somewhere, probably the team server. The team server needs to relay that traffic to wherever it needs to go. And then it needs to send that traffic back. 
So um, both sides of that process need to be um, extensible by the operator to accommodate that. A framework also provides reusable components, which um, I think is self-explanatory, but they're, they're components that the framework provides to make the operator's life easier. Um, we'll see an example of that on the next slide. So this is an example I've taken from the Metasploit framework. Metasploit is a very mature product at this point, and it's great to look at um, if we're looking for inspiration on those frameworky things. Um, but if you're not familiar with Metasploit, anybody can write a module for it. Anybody can write um, an enumeration module or an exploit module. Um, for that framework for other people to use. And being a framework, it provides a lot of helpers for you to, you know, in, in writing those modules. So this example is taken from the PS exec module. And um, the first thing you do in a module is to define some module information. So this includes, you know, a name, um, a description, your um, an author or multiple authors, references, and so on and so forth. And that information from the module is picked up by the rest of the framework. So that as the operator, whilst you're using the UI and you search for a module, you can, you know, search it by name or whatever. And then it comes up and you can see the name, you can see its description and a bunch of other things. Uh, you can also register options. So this being a, um, a PS exec module, the author here has said, well, you can define um, options for the service name, um, paths, and a bunch of other things that are, you know, important to that module. But more importantly, there are some options that you don't have to explicitly define in the module. So the framework knows that this is like a remote exploit module or whatever. It knows that it needs the R host or, you know, your targets. And the operator or the, the author of the module doesn't need to specifically put R host in as an option. The framework already knows that that's required. So that takes, you know, that burden off the operator or the author. And you also have includes and helpers, which are down here. So these includes are other Metasploit modules that you can bring into your module. And um, because uh, this module is uh, using, you know, SMP exec and SMB, there's already a module for that. So you don't have to actually implement an entire SMB library in your module or even the PS exec process in your module. It's bringing in PowerShell and XEs because you know you need to execute something. So as the module author, you don't even have to you know, worry about the payload that you're going to send. The framework does it for you. Um, and you can see here that uh, the uh, service file name, so this is um, service file name here, is an option. If you haven't you know, defined this option, it takes a default. And um, so these are the default behaviors. So if you haven't uh, provided a, a name, it will pick, it'll just make a random one for you. And this rand text alpha is um, another module in the framework. So you don't have to worry about, oh, okay, well, I want a random string. Now I have to write a function for that. It's in the framework already. And, uh, those are the biggest st strengths of frameworks is that as the module author, they allow you just to focus on the, the task that you want and not worry about, you know, things that you don't want to worry about. Okay. So where to start? Well, this is like, it seems pretty uh, cliche, but the first thing you should really understand is what are your motivations? Um, 
what does success look like? And that kind of sounds like we're at some sort of management retreat. But um, <clears throat> you kind of really need to think about what you're actually trying to achieve because you need to build it and you need to know what it's going to look like at the end. So, you know, you you might be doing this just for fun. You might be doing it just to teach yourself some stuff. You might want it to teach other people. Um, you might be writing an internal tool if you're like a pen tester or a red teamer. Um, you might even want to sell it. You might want to open source it. Um, and if I had to draw like some sort of parallel, I'd think about if you were going to build a car, it's very easy to say, I'm going to build a car, but there are a lot of different types of car, right? If you want something to take your family to the beach, you probably don't want a McLaren P1. And likewise, if you want to go around the Nürburgring pretty quick, you probably don't want, I don't know, some sort of absurd people carrier. So even though they're both cars, they are quite different and they have different features to, you know, make that goal a reality. And there are all sorts of things that you, you could think, oh, that would be really cool to have in my framework. That would be, you know, da, 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 da. But if it doesn't, you know, contribute towards what you're actually trying to achieve, then it's kind of pointless. And if you uh, miss features that you need, then you're not going to achieve your goal and you're going to end up with something that you didn't want. So if you've never seen um, Moscow, this is a pretty good way to try and narrow down what you think you want. So this stands for must have, could have, oh, sorry, must have, should have, could have and won't have. So your must-haves are like mandatory things, right? These are things that your framework absolutely has to have to uh, perform its function. Uh, Should-haves are important and they, they add significant value, but they are not uh, strictly mandatory um, to function. Could-haves are nice to haves but not really important and won't haves are least critical inappropriate or um, undesirable and like the won't haves you can split into kind of two camps i guess you can have won't haves like period and won't haves this time and i'll sort of expand on this time um in a minute So what you really want to do is you want to get your goal straight and think about all the things that you think you might want in your tool. Um, you can also take inspiration from other frameworks as well and tooling. That's perfectly okay. I don't think that's cheating because you kind of want the best parts of everything. And, you know, why reinvent the wheel sometimes? You can take good ideas from all sorts of places and that's perfectly fine in my book. And then what you want to do is narrow everything down to an attainable first release um, using that uh, Moscow uh, method. And by attainable, I mean attainable within your current skill set and your time budget. And I think a, a mistake that a lot of people make is to look at things that have been out there for a long time. So you look at Empire, you look at Metasploit Framework, and you look at Covenant, Posh C2, and all of those well-established projects. And they think, that's what I want to build. I'm going to build like my version of that framework. But the thing is that those projects, they didn't get there overnight. They didn't just pop out of nowhere at the quality that they are now. Some of them are months or years old. So if you're trying to replicate that straight off the bat, you know, you've probably got easily six or 12 months worth of work. And what you're going to do is you're going to work on it for, a, I don't know, a couple of months or however long you can stand. 
you're going to get fed up with it, you're going to get demotivated, and then you're just going to put it to the side. You'll come back to it, maybe at some point, and you'll look at it, you'll look at it and you'll think, well, I've only done about 20% of what I hoped to achieve. And you're probably not going to pick it up again. And it's going to end up in the uh, software graveyard. So small iterative releases are easily more achievable and far more likely to keep you motivated. Um, and you're also going to grow your project with your skill set. I mean, you can you look at a lot of features in a lot of advanced frameworks now, and you, I mean, they're pretty they're pretty like advanced concepts. So if you're um, if you're doing this to teach yourself, um, you know, coding, it's probably not realistic to shoot for you know those kinds of um, uh, you know features or whatever. So having a small project that's 100% complete is a lot better and it's a lot more satisfying than a large project that, that's you know 10 or 20% complete. Um, so when I say attainable first release, it's going to be like probably the bare minimum of what will make a C2 um, framework function. No bells or whistles. But it's something to aim for, right? So you're going to set yourself a schedule. So you're going to say, I'm going to target my first release, my initial release in one month or whatever you think is realistic. So you've got your Moscow, you've got your must haves and your should haves, and you're probably going to prioritize those the most. So your could haves, you're probably not going to um, really worry about too much because you just want something that's going to function, that's going to work. And you need to be cognizant of scope creep. So it's really easy to just think, oh, I'll just add this, I'll just add this. Um, people post things on like Twitter all the time of just, did you know you could do this or, you know, new techniques, blah, 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 blah. And it's really easy just to try and add those in. When really what you want to do is just stick to what you had planned for, you know, this release. And if you see, you know, cool stuff coming into the public domain, you can say, well, okay, well, I'm not going to do it now. Maybe I'll do it in the next release. And for God's sake, pace yourself. So, you know, two hours a day for a month is not the same as 12 hours on four Fridays in a month. And maybe this is just a personal thing for me, but little and often is, it's just a more enjoyable way to code than having to sit at your desk for however many hours because you feel like you need to get something out. <clears throat> so let's talk about languages for a, for a sec. There are, you know, a billion different languages out there and you're gonna have to decide on something for your server and your implant and sort of depending on your model, you might consider writing a client as well for the operators, but we're all just, I'm just going to sort of focus on the server and the implant. Uh, for the server side, I think you're much better off um, building off a framework that already exists, some sort of web um, framework. So you have um, Python ones like Flask and Django. Lots of different ones in C sharp. You have Blazor, which provides you know like a nice um, web UI. You can have something that's driven more by um, APIs or RPC, and you have lots of others like Vue, React, and Angular. Um, and on the implant side, you kind of have to think about maybe. Well, I mean, this goes back to your goals, really. I mean, what it what what platform you really want to target with your framework. I mean, you can make your framework implant agnostic. A lot of a lot of them already do that, like Mystic. You can write your own implants for a framework, and that would be, you know, really great if your framework did that. But you probably also want to include an implant 
um, just to make it easier for people to pick up and use. And so you have OS um, specific languages like um, C Sharp to target the .NET framework, and you have uh, Swift on uh, Mac OS. You have languages that cross compile like Nim and Go and Rust. And then you have um, actual proper cross-platform languages like .NET, .NET Core, and sort of Python. Um, but you certainly need to sort of consider how these elements are going to talk to each other and uh, which language facilitates that best. So, you know, I've already said that the control server should provide a means of uh, communicating with your implant over any protocol or any means you want. So you have to consider is the framework that I'm choosing going to be able to facilitate that? Can I do that in Python? Can I do that in, you know, whatever? And then you kind of consider, well, if my chosen language doesn't really do that, do I need to consider a different language? And if you don't really know that language, is it worth learning or is it worth sticking to what you know and just trying to make do the best you can. I think that's a decision only like you can make based on your goals and your priorities. Um, if you're learning, if you're doing this as a learning process, then maybe it's worth it. Maybe you specifically want to use this project as an opportunity to learn, you know, uh, C sharp, for example, I mean, that's pretty, uh, pretty popular choice then yeah by all means step out of your comfort zone and that kind of goes back to the attainable first um release thing is that if you're learning something new you've got to like start small with it so in terms of uh design patterns there are two that i really um go for the first is this command design pattern, and I think this is pretty good for picturing the flow of stuff between the different components. And by components, I mean like separate components, such as the server and the implant in the operator, not really um, internal to any one of those. So we have the operator, which is kind of like the clients and the operator wants to send a task to an implant so you're probably going to send some information maybe it's over an api you're going to post some information or post this data to your team server which is kind of like the director in the, um, this design pattern nomenclature um, so in this example i'm simply I've got a simple task model that has a command and some arguments, and I want to task an implant that we're going to identify by a GUID. The server then takes that task and sends it to the implant. So that's kind of the command. And then the implant, which is the receiver, is going to execute that task. Now I've highlighted a task GUID here because it's in this model that the server um, deals with, but it's not in the model that the, um, that the operator sends. So the server, if I want my server to track like task progress with the implant, it's gonna need something. So my server, <clears throat> excuse me, in this example, adds um, a GUID to all of the tasks. And then when the implant can, when the implant talks back to the server, it can report, it can use the same GUID so that the server can track commands with the implant. And this kind of brings me on to the subject of contracts. Um, so you have uh, contracts between the different um, elements 
uh, within your the overall solution. So you have contracts between the operator and the server, the server and the implant, and maybe even the server and any storage that you want. So if you're storing data, so you can start and stop your team server without losing data, um, then what you really need is different models for each of those contracts. Don't try and use the same model between every element because you're just going to get a little bit unstuck. So here's a code example of a task request. So this is what an operator might post to the server. This is a request. So it's got a command, an array of arguments, and an artifact. So if this was like an execute assembly um, command, the artifact would be like the whole assembly. So you're going to push like, I don't know, you're going to push Rubius down to your implant and you're going to tell it to execute with these arguments. Um, the server will then add on that task GUID and give me back that GUID. So as the operator, I can then use that GUID to check the status of that task. And when I'm asking for that, I don't necessarily, I mean, you might want to, it's kind of up to you. You might not want all of this original data back. Like you don't, you might not, I don't need to see like the whole assembly coming back. I don't need to have Rubius just going backwards and forwards on the wire between me and the server. All I really want maybe is just the result and the status. And you're going to find that, you know, if you're using like something like entity framework for storage, if you're using C sharp, you have to decorate your classes with all sorts of things. So you have to have like attributes on your properties that define the like primary keys and stuff. And that information just doesn't need to be coming back to the operator. It doesn't need to be going to the implant. So at every point, you have to uh, tra sort of like translate each model to a different model and then pass it um, along the chain. There's also this uh, template method pattern, and this is pretty good for planning, you know, plan more carefully planning your code, what's your actual code going to look like. And I'm sorry that all of my code examples are in C sharp, mainly because that's all I really know, but also that's what people are kind of more interested in, I think. So on the left, I've got an abstract class. that's going to act as like um, a building block to build custom listeners on my server. Um, I'm going to have a protected field at the top, which is an iTask manager. And that is an interface that has these um, methods on it. Uh, so QTask is the method that an operator would um, use to task an agent. So it would take in like a GUID. And I've just put a byte array, but this would be the, um, the implant task model and then get tasks and receive output will be used on like the listener side so that when an implant is talking to the listener, it can just use this task manager just to grab the tasks and any tasks that are queued for it and also give the server any output that the implant is sending. And then the listener it just has this um, init or initialize method to bring in that task manager and then just a start and a stop. So let's have a look at what that could look like in C sharp. So this is my abstract class. You can see I've got the I task manager here and this init just brings in the task manager and just assigns it to that field. And then it has two abstract methods, start and stop. And when somebody comes along and implements their own custom listener, they inherit from this uh, listener class. 
And this is the entire um, class here. It's obviously not very functional. It's just an example. But you can see I've highlighted where it would use the task manager. And as the author of the custom listener, you don't have to worry about where the task manager is coming from or how it works. Because you've implemented this abstract class, the framework is taking care of that for you. And all you have to do is just the task manager is there as a field for you to use as appropriate. So to get tasks, you just call get tasks and to send any output into the server to sort of like process, you just call um, receive output. So abstraction and interfaces are, you know, just, they're just so useful. Um, in terms of any implant that you're going to write, base primitives are better in my view than I call it command uh, proliferation. And you know you can see some um, C2 tools just have like a bazillion, you type like help or whatever and you just get a, a bazillion um, commands that you can execute. And like me, I find it a bit overwhelming because I don't know, it's just a lot, but it's also not that mm, like flexible for the operator. So, Let's use Mimikatz as, as an example here. You could build in a command um, to your framework that will automatically push Mimikatz down to the implant, um, load it up in some way, execute it, and send the results back. You could do that for Seatbelt and for Rubius. And it's very, you know, okay, it's very nice just to have an automated way just to push all of these assemblies down. But then as soon as the user or you know the operator says well i want to push down something custom you've not made it very easy to do that um so the base primitives are more about what allows these commands to actually happen so mimikatz is tied to manual mapping in um like c sharp anyway so instead of providing like a Mimikatz command, you could just um, provide some sort of means of just manual mapping um, in your implant. And that will allow the user just to send down an arbitrary um, DLL or executable arbitrary commands, just map it into the implant, execute it and send the results back. You can also you know, expose reflective DLLs, .NET reflection, PowerShell, sockets, you know, whatever you want. But the closer or the more easily you expose these base primitives to your operator, the more easily they can write custom commands for your implant. And in terms of commands, this is something that I see quite often, not even not just in like C2 tools, but all sorts of tools that bring in some sort of user input. This, you know, the command is a string and they're just, well, this is a switch statement, but it could easily be like, um, if else, if else, if else, if, if the command equals this, do this. And it's just not good. Um, it's not very flexible, obviously. It's difficult to expand and maintain. You know, if you want to add another one in here, it's going to be like massive. And if you've got a more complicated method than these, it's just, just don't. <laughs> um, it's difficult to handle exceptions. You could wrap this whole thing in like a try catch, in which case you're only catching like maybe like generic exceptions, or you could wrap each one of these in a try catch and that just makes it even bigger. You can see we've got code duplication. So 
we're requesting this like get current directory a whole bunch of times, which isn't really a problem for something so short, but if it's something more complicated, then it that just becomes untenable. It's not particularly performant because most of the time I think, especially if it's uh, an if else if else if, it always starts from the top and you gotta go down and down and down and down. Um, we're also forcing everything to be a string and it's just, you know, it's just ugly. This is not a good way to um, code something. So what's a better um, example perhaps? Is again, to implement those abstracts. So I've got um, an abstract class here, which is called um, implant command. Um, it has um, a string, which is called command. I probably should have called it name or something, but this is like the name of the command. And it's got an abstract uh, method uh, called ex execute. It'll bring in the task that's been sent down to it. And it has another in it, which brings in um, a class in this case, in case it's called implant, but implant has several public methods you can see over on this uh, right hand side here for sending results back sending an error back and all sorts of things so the implant class again is not something that the operator will uh, care about but you can expose public methods on it um, for them to do useful things so like the listener example we want to create our own command that will inherit from implant command. We give it a name. In this case, it's just ls. Um, I've also thrown like sharp exploit in here as an example. Um, as an example of like decoupling um, a lot of like the backend execution from the actual command, and that means that as a user, if I want to implement another command that uses like sharp exploit, they can do that really easily. Um, you know, again, we're just making it as flexible as we can. And of course, um, abstracts, you are forced to implement. So you have to, um, you know, put some sort of implementation in when you override the, uh, this method and you can, as the author, you can just put whatever, whatever you want in there. And again, you don't have to worry about the task. It automatically is brought into the command for you. You don't have to worry about where implant is coming from. It's automatically done for you. You just call the methods that you want. Um, and then you can, this is within that implant um, class is that at some point we call uh, load commands and we can use uh, reflection to automatically instantiate every type of implant command and initialize them so they're ready to be used. And then that handle task method, where in the previous example was that big old switch case, this is what it would look like. So all we need to do is find the class that has the name that we're looking for, you know, in the actual um, task that comes down. If we didn't find it, we send an error back saying that, well, the command isn't found. Otherwise we just execute it. Uh, I got another example here using attributes, but I'm actually running out of time. So I'll have to skip to the summary. Um, so to start with, absolutely know your goals, know what you're trying to build and why you're trying to build it. Only by knowing your goals will you really understand what features you need to put into your framework. But I'd also encourage you to focus on framework features rather than C2 features. So by C2 features, I don't know, um, I guess I'm referring to command uh, proliferation again. But I would definitely focus, especially in the early days of your of your framework, is is focus on those framework um, elements. 
who really want to provide the operators the means to customize and expand your framework the way they want to do it. Prioritize those base uh, primitives on your implant and provide an easy means for the operators to interact with them. Um, abstracts and interfaces are incredibly useful. I can't think really of a, of a, a better way to provide that extensibility um, to the operators. Plan small attainable releases. Don't try and do like a big, big bang release for your, you know, your first one. And if this is something that you want to maintain over the long term, I would also say to limit each release to only one like big feature. So if you look at usually if you look at release notes for, for software, most of them, the vast majority of the changes are bug fixes. You will then get other types of um, minor improvements and you'll probably only really see like one or maybe two like big new features. Um, so that is a kind of software design lifecycle thing that I would really encourage. Don't try and change too much in one go. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Um, I hope the talk was useful. Um, if you've got any questions, please let me know. I'm going to try and be around for a Q&A during the um, village. If not, feel free to hit me up on any of those um, socials I showed at the beginning. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks very much.